If all citizens are equal before the law, then a bus with 100 passengers clearly has a right to 100 times more road space than a car with one. This is something that is forgotten by people who own cars. So, exclusive lanes. All large urban roads and many small ones should have exclusive lanes for buses. All urban roads, large and small, should have large sidewalks and protected bikeways. How do we distribute road space between pedestrians, bicycles, public transport, and cars? Public transport users are exemplary citizens who should be given priority in the use of road space. And they should not be put underground. I mean, subways may be wonderful, but why put public transport users underground like rats? First, they should be given the surface with light. They should be rewarded with priority use of surface road with natural sunlight. In Bogota, we made effort to promote bicycling. We, we now have about 500 kilometers of protected bikeways, and now 19% of the people in Bogota go by car, and 6% go by bicycle. 12 years ago, it was zero people using bicycles. That means that for every three people in a car, one is going in a bicycle. Every street should have a protected bicycle way, as a right, not as a cute kind of feature that we do to be nice. A protected bikeway also in Bogotá, this is in developing countries, they are important. They increase the social status of cyclists. They show that a citizen on a $30 bicycle is equally important to one in a $30,000 car. I would say in most developing countries, using a bicycle saves at least 15 to 20% of someone's income a huge improvement to a quality of life for the poor people. Why are bicycles more used in Denmark and the Netherlands than in Spain or Italy, where the weather is much better? Why? Clearly, it's because a millionaire in the Netherlands or an ambassador would be very happy to go on a bicycle. But in Spain or Italy, they feel they are too important, the millionaire, to be in a bicycle. This kind of infrastructure that is more democratic, this will also make cities more egalitarian. But the issue is equality. It's not transport. Transport is a minor surrounding issue. In Bogota, we build more than 70 kilometers of pedestrian and bicycle highways. This is a very interesting concept. I think all developing countries cities should be like this, and even advanced cities for the future. Hundreds of kilometers of these highways. In terms of transport, a good city is not one where even the poor people use cars, but rather one where even wealthy people use public transport and bicycles. Sustainable transport creates access. Unsustainable transport, which we see widely across the world, cuts the poor off from access to opportunity. <coughs> Sustainable transport promotes health. Unsustainable transport robs people of their health and their livelihoods. Sustainable transport promotes broader and more sustainable economic development. Unsustainable transport creates fewer jobs per dollar or asset of currency invested, and it also has lower long-term productivity. Unsustainable transport robs us of the capacity to create sustainable development. And we have now demonstrated sustainable transport at, uh, in, in a practical, achievable way in many cities across the world. We now need the support of national institutions and multilateral institutions to help create the conditions to take sustainable transport to scale. Urbanization is one of the most profound things happening across the world today. So we need to get this right and do it quickly. I think that we currently have a billion people who still live in poverty. We have a billion people who will be moving to cities in the next few years. So it means that both from the side of poverty eradication as from the side of the, the urbanization, I think that the decisions that we are going to make in the next few years in terms of transport investments will be critical in terms of the legacy that we will be left with. And I think that Enrique demonstrates it very clearly. Right? If you start with a blank canvas, you have a lot more opportunities than if you have to retrofit an existing city. The United States may be an example in many ways, but its legacy to the world is suburbs, which the first to realize today that it's a disaster in environmental and in every other way. It cannot be normal that today we tell any three-year-old child anywhere in the world, watch out, a car, and the child jumps in fright. 
and with a good reason, because there are tens, and I like to emphasize this number, tens of thousands of children are killed by cars every year in the world. And the amazing thing is not that this happens, but that we think this is normal. But this is an advanced way. So clearly this is not, I think we have not found, as you say, we have not found what the ideal human environment is. I think clearly we are in a mess. It's possible to create environments which will combine higher densities with those things that people seek in the suburbs, such as uh, safe places for children to go out and play without having any fear of getting killed by cars, hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers of bikeways, only bicycle highways, uh, busways, where. So I believe we even have to demolish suburbs, to start demolishing things and redoing. This is a matter almost of survival because this has to do with global warming. The principles of excess, the principle of affordability, the principle of efficiency, the principle of equity, the principle of safety, and the principle of connectivity, particularly between rural and urban areas, how are they captured in all these things together? The global aspirational goal and the attendant targets and indicators, that will be the challenge of fashioning sustainable